Please be seated. Well, we made it, didn't we? We made it through the wilderness of Lent. We started a journey 46 days ago on Ash Wednesday, and we made it all the way to Easter. And it feels pretty good, doesn't it? There's probably not a more exciting moment of the year than after that sprinkling rite, when we get to come back and we get to say, Alleluia, Christ is risen for the first time in a really long time. In a really long time. And we made it. We got through. And uh, Easter is, is just such a wonderful time. Now, we, we had a chance to have a, a visible uh, ex- expression of what it means to, to travel that journey uh, through Holy Week uh, and Easter. If, if we were paying attention, we noticed that the colors changed, didn't they? The colors changed as we went. Uh, we started last week uh, on Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, with red. And then on Friday, we, we had black vestments on. Right? And now we have white. Now we have white. We return to our white. And uh, you, you may or may not know this, but uh, priests... Uh, and cler- members of the clergy uh, always carry around, carry around with us a symbol of, uh, of Good Friday and the victory over death that we have in Easter. Uh, probably notice that priests wear black, and uh, deacons wear black, right? Uh, a lot of the time we wear black. Well, the black is representative of that death. It's representative of that death. Now, Father Harry does it the right way, by the way. Father Harry wears his black cassock underneath his white alb. I just wear the alb over my clericals, but Father Harry wears the cassock. That's the way it's supposed to be. The cassock represents that death shroud of Jesus. And the alb, the white alb that we wear, uh, is our baptismal garment. It represents that victory over death. So anyone who is baptized is, uh, can wear a, a white alb to church. Did you know that? You can, you can wear a white owl because that's your baptismal garment and it represents what we're celebrating today and that is Easter. That is that eternal life conquers death. Now when we hear the Easter story, there's something that's very important uh, in that Easter story. And it's, it happens in all four Gospels, all four expressions of the resurrection. And... That tells us that it's important. If something shows up in all four Gospels, that tells us it's something we really want to pay attention to. And that is, who discovered the resurrected Lord? I see a hand. I see a hand. The women. The women. The women. The women discovered the resurrected Lord. And uh, being a Christian priest, I would say that that is the single most important event in the history of human salvation, in, human, in humankind, was the resurrection of Jesus, right? And every one of the four Gospels tells us that it was women who discovered the resurrected Lord. And when we read the scriptures, we have to do so through what we call a, a lens. We have to do biblical criticism. Right? We have to look at things like the time and the place. We have to put all of these things into perspective. And sometimes when we do that, uh, it can be frustrating because we can find that uh, the, the manuscripts don't always match from one to the other. Right? And sometimes there's a political bend. Sometimes uh, there, there's very likely this possibility that maybe one person who's translating a manuscript might be looking at this manuscript and saying, uh, no, well, Jesus wouldn't have said that and changed it. Right? That, that, could be, that could be possible. Right? It could be possible that there's a, a political bend. Right? We talked just the other day about Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate sure sounded like he was a nice guy, didn't he? In some of the, in some of the scriptures, Pontius Pilate sounds like he's a nice guy. Uh, but Pontius Pilate was not a nice guy. Pontius Pilate was a brutal leader. But there's a lot of scholars who would say that uh, the reason that Pontius Pilate is pictured as a nice guy is because... Well, who was in charge of the world at that time? Well, the Roman Empire. And if those scriptures were going to be passed on, if those scriptures were going to be permitted to be shared, well, we want to make sure that the Roman Empire 
looks like a good guy. So we're going to make Pontius Pilate sound like a good guy. There's a political bend. There's also spelling. You know, sometimes uh, maybe spelling or handwriting uh, comes into play, right? That, that gets changed along the way. There's a, an old saying that says that the theology of the Christian church at one time hung on an iota. And that means uh, the letter I in the Greek alphabet is the letter iota. And the reason they say that is because they were looking at manuscripts when they were trying to define the theology of the Holy Trinity and they were looking at the word homoousius versus homoousis, which means a similar substance versus a, the same substance. So the, the theology of the Christian faith hung on an iota because that little iota made a big difference. And that we, we still use that expression today. We talk about uh, something like as small as an iota. right? But, but we know that if something got carried along in all four scriptures, all four gospels, that that means that uh, even though there were the opportunity uh, to change it for political reasons or spelling reasons or whatever the reason may be, uh, we know that there's a pretty good chance that that's the way that happened. Now, we know that even in today's world, Women don't always have it easy, right? Women don't always have it easy. A lot of times, uh, women don't get the same uh, high-paying jobs that, that sometimes men get, and if they get those jobs, sometimes they're not paid as well as men, right? And that's here in the United States in the 21st century, right? So imagine putting ourselves uh, in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, and, and it's even more intense, right? Uh, just a few years ago, really, uh, in some parts of the Middle East, uh, women were given the, pr the, the privilege of driving for the first time ever. So think about that when we're thinking about the context, the time, and the place, and the idea that this was left in the scriptures, right, and how important that, that is. That tells us that that's probably how it happened, and that probably uh, women were, were considered the least likely people to discover this very important event. Probably not very likely. And, and even in our scriptures, right? We, we hear the Gospel of John, and, and John says, you know, uh, I, I, just so you know, I got there before Peter did, right? When, when John goes to check it out, John and Peter go to check it out, John says, I got there first. I let Peter go in first, but, but I got there first, right? So there were lots of opportunities to change the story, and they didn't get changed. So I want us to pay attention to that, because any one of these male disciples would have loved to have been the first person to discover the resurrected Jesus. It wasn't one of them. It was one of the women. One of the most uh, unlikely people in, in, their, in their estimation to discover the single most important event in the history of salvation. And that is what I want us to remember when we think about Easter. Because on Ash Wednesday we made, uh, we made a a commitment as a congregation. We were going to talk about this idea of mission. Right? We were going to talk about building our relationships with each other and with God, and I think we've done that. Right? Uh, but even had we not done that, uh, the resurrection still happened. The resurrection still came. Because even when we feel like we are un unlikely to be recipients of the grace of the resurrection, uh, we are worthy because God made us worthy. It is God who made us worthy. It's God who made you worthy and God who made me worthy. Right? I hear voices uh, sometimes from, from time to time in the back of my head saying, uh, Tim, you're, you're not worthy. You're, you're no good for this. Right? But that's not true. Those voices are not true. And the mystery of Easter proves that. The mystery of Easter proves that. Uh, not because of anything I've done, not because of anything I didn't do, uh, but just because uh, God made it so. Even if I feel unlikely, God made it so. The resurrection happened, didn't it? The resurrection happened. Whether, uh, whether we felt like we deserved it or not, uh, God made it so. So we're now in this Easter time. The Lord is risen, and he rose for you, and he rose for me. Right? And it doesn't... All of the things that we put on ourselves, uh, they, don't, they don't really matter. Right? Sometimes, sometimes maybe we think, that, oh, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm too fat. I'm too thin. I'm too short. I'm too tall. None of those things matter. 
Because God gives us that love, God gives us that grace, God gives us his resurrected son because he decided we were worthy. He made us worthy. And because of that, we get to wear these white garments that go over our black garments. Right? Our eternal life conquers our death. Jesus conquered death with his resurrection. And because he loves us, because he loves you, and because he loves me, we get to share in that eternal life. Amen.